And I'm Bob Silverman, the president of AFSA. And on behalf of AFSA, I'd like to welcome all of you to our annual award ceremony. Secretary Kerry met earlier this afternoon with the award winners, and he's now at the White House and regrets uh, that he cannot join us. Uh, AFSA is honored that Deputy Secretary Bill Burns will be joining shortly. He's on his way from Dallas Airport. He came back straight from Fox. Uh, we've been meeting about the press uh, to join us and to celebrate both the ex uh, exemplary performance and the constructive dissent within all the foreign affairs agencies that AFSA uh, recognizes. A special thanks to Acting Director General of the Foreign Service, Hans Clem, who has co-sponsored this event with us and allowed us to use this uh, magnificent room. So thank you, Hans. This ceremony marks the 47th Annual AFSA Awards Program. AFSA began this ceremony in 1967 with two dissent awards. And over the years, we have added additional awards to recognize other forms of dissent and other outstanding performance. We now will have a total of eight awards, recognizing uh, four dissent award winners and four exemplary performance award winners within the Foreign Service family. Let me also add that AFSA sponsors a separate award program for excellence in language learning, which are the 10 Sinclair Awards of $1,000 each given through the Foreign Service Institute. And this is in, uh, thanks to the late Foreign Service Officer Matilda Sinclair, who endowed AFSA with a grant uh, for these important awards in her name. So let's start with the American Foreign Service Association Annual Award for Lifetime Contributions to American Diplomacy. We have with us this afternoon four recipients of past Lifetime Award winners. So I would like to recognize Ambassador and Former Director General Joan Clark, Ambassador Tom Boyad, Ambassador George Landau, and Senator Richard Luger. Let's give them all a round of applause. visas to foreign nationals 
and assistance to the many American citizens visiting overseas in Germany, Saudi Arabia, and Yugoslavia. As Consul General, he served first in war-torn South Vietnam, then in more peaceful Athens, Seoul, and finally Naples. And in all of his postings, Stu was the consular diplomat and, forester, and consular service professional. In light of what was to come, it seems appropriate that his final Foreign Service assignment was to the Department's Office of the Historian. This experience helped to shape Stu's passion for creating and curating the Foreign Affairs Oral History Program, which he currently directs at the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. Since 1985, he has conducted over a thousand oral history interviews of retired American diplomats. In recognition of his achievements, Stu received the Foreign Service Cup, the Cyrus R. Vance Award for the Advancing Knowledge of American Diplomacy, the Forrest C. Pogue Award from the Mid-Atlantic Mid Regional Oral History Association, a special type citation to the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the admiration of his, and esteem of his colleagues in here. And now, Stu, it is my great privilege and honor to present you with AFSA's lifetime contribution to the American Diplomacy Award.
been responsible for the publication of 75 books on diplomacy. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. 
wars. We have World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Central America, the Balkans, Iraq, Israel, Afghanistan, Biafra, and all that I'm sure I missed a couple of major ones. Uh, so we have civil wars, rules, attacks on embassies, bombings, ambushes, and threats in general. Constant stories abound, getting Americans, including the crazies, out of trouble with visa cases and problems with fraud and culture in the country. We have romance. For example, we have the account of FSO John Melby and his affair with the left wing playwright William Helen and his subsequent problems with security. <laughs> we have stories about the evil senator, Joseph McCarthy, and the unimpressive way the State Department dealt with those matters. Negotiating with the Soviets, disarming nuclear matters, base treaties play a significant role in the election. Washington personalities, including presidents on business overseas, are common at home, in quite frank terms. The rise of women and minorities in the ranks of foreign service over the years is a major theme in our friendship. Uh, in our interviews, we include the civil service, political ambassadors, other agencies, some congressmen uh, involved in uh, diplomatic matters. Uh, this is not a history of foreign service. This is a very broad diplomatic uh, history. Families are not neglected. We have a considerable number of council wives in the FSOs, particularly in the earlier years of the service. We have some children's recollections including that of the actress Kathleen Turner, whose father was vice counsel in Cuba, uh, the Castro took over. Now, Terry McNamara uh, uh, tells us uh, having to help in the delivery of his wife's twins in an almost deserted hospital in Catania during the war era when he was on electricity. I might add that there is a British diplomatic oral history program which is uh, housed at Cambridge University. You can get to it uh, by going to Cambridge on the uh, internet and, and, and getting it. But they've come to enough. We, we inspired that. And uh, uh, just the last thing about the Rogers Act, we're celebrating the 90th anniversary of the Rogers Act. So the foreign school in the Counselor service was melded with the diplomatic service and the foreign service. This is really a good thing. I mean, it makes absolute sense. But uh, many counselor, counselors, including on this merger, have about the same enthusiasm that modern day Ukrainian and Russian speakers, Sunnis and Shiites, Serbs and Poles, <laughs> and Arabs and Jews, to, of course, uh, ever spend, uh, make them live peacefully under one of Back in 1924, the State Department reflected all the European class prejudices, especially those of the British. American consuls dealt with trade, tourists, police, and hospitals. All were grubby things to be left to the lower elements of the union. Diplomats, on the other hand, worked down with other diplomats who were from the same class level, of course. There's a story, probably a popular story. Uh, Caleb uh, coming from a major U.S. Embassy. Embassy needs a formal claim, third secretary of Persia. <laughs> uh, in 1924, the Council of Staff the establishment suspected that the diplomats would seize control of the State Department and exclude councils from the goodies, such as promotions and interesting positions. The Council of Resentment was right on target. When I tried to form a service, <laughs> 31 years after the act, there was not one person who had identified as a council officer by assignments who reached the rank of an SO2, uh, today's OC upgraded in general. And I appeared I did not pay much attention to the answer. So I sort of associated with a political officer, Donald and Faith, to dismiss him. As an indicator of how things stood in the mid-1960s, I was a chief of 
Nassau section of Delaware, my master is George Kennedy, an icon of the Foreign Service. Every day, Ambassador Kennedy went to his office, passing the entrance to the Nassau section. He never put his head in the office. It was only after pleas to his secretary, Dorothy Hester, that I was able to get him to come down and shake hands with the council staff at Christmas. The times have changed. In a recent interview I did with Jeff David Dow, um, the career foreign service officer, he noted that when he arrived at Mexico City in 1998 as ambassador, he made a point of having his limousine pull up to the entrance of the, to the council section. He had a diplomatic entrance to make his first appearance in his new job, as he described it, this is a deliberate gesture uh, to those meeting in the largest council <coughs> section of the United States where he puts some of the priorities. So times have deep and change, and that's a certain change in the times for the better. Uh, and as a true representative of all those serving overseas and their needs, this, these are the sort of things that you get out of uh, and you Anything you want, you can find. Um, so I urge you all to go to our program.
and assistance for a variety of charitable organizations in Mexico City that provide help to the disadvantaged and the vulnerable, from orphans to pregnant teenage girls seeking refuge from violence. The group's activities have touched countless lives, and as its leader, Carrie is someone who has made a difference. A perfect example of the kind of providing help across national ties that the Avis Bowen Award is meant to honor. Before presenting the award, I would also like to mention the runner-up, Javier Dario Araque. We commend him for his dedicated work in Tijuana with abandoned or abused children and those suffering from HIV AIDS. And now I would like to ask Claire Coleman to come up to the podium accept the award on behalf of her friend, Harry Osborne, who unfortunately could not be with us today. <coughs> Before asking Carol up on stage, I'd like to acknowledge two runners-up, Carol Johnson from 
Embassy of Quran, and Miriam Abdul, Embassy Engineer, who's here with us today. Please ask my colleague and friend, Miriam, to please stand. to present 
presented the first of our four December awards, which is the W. Averill Perriman Award for Entry of the Officers. Well founded constructive dissent is essential to sound foreign policy. Leaders benefit from robust discussion of choices which is why diversity of opinion, and frankly, the diversity of personnel, is so important to professional foreign service. Silence dissent, in the best case, we have suboptimal policy that prevents us from bringing our A game and proposing a diplomatic solution that would make everyone better off. In the worst case, the lack of dissent may lead to preventable death, destruction, and denial of civil rights and human liberties. In the wake of Edwards' noted revelations on government surveillance, the existence of an active in-house dissent channel becomes all the more important. Might the existence of and a culture of support for an institutional dissent channel at that agency have changed the course of history? At the Department of State, we are fortunate enough to have such a channel. However, it is not enough to have a vehicle for change. Rather, we must have individuals brave enough to use it. It is not easy being alone, dissenting voice in the face of established practice, power, or seniority. It takes courage to make the case, and more of it to persevere. While department regulations protect the employee from retribution, in our foreign service culture, as some of our nominators themselves noted, dissent is not always valued or appreciated. Thankfully, that is not the case at AFSA. AFSA values dissent in word and deed, and sometimes finds cause to dissent itself to decisions made by the department, for instance, last summer's meritorious service increases. But even then, like our awardees, we do it respectfully, through appropriate channels, and with the service's best interests at heart.
you know, this side didn't say our direction. Our family wouldn't be here, could be here today. They would love this, and it's their support and encouragement that keeps me going. Finally, I'd like to thank Mike Scanlon, who in many ways was the uh, spark for this. Mike is the uh, director of uh, EUR UMB right now, but a few years ago he was the charge of Vincent Belarus when I, when I got to live there with my wife before I joined the Foreign Service. And, uh, on the night of the presidential election in 2010, there was a mass protest, and uh, most of the opposition candidates were arrested and some of them were beaten. Uh, a few months later, when the court when their, uh, case went to trial, Mike personally attended many of the hearings. And I can tell you as an American, I was exceedingly proud to have him there representing our country and our values. And that really stuck with me. Uh, seeing what he and the other fellows in the students were willing to do really pushed me to, to do this. So I'd really like to thank Mike and all of our colleagues who made the tough stands for their service and inspiration.
and then ultimately use the dissent channel to elevate and amplify his concerns. His purpose was not to take sides with one office or another, but to ensure that newly named Secretary Kerry had the benefit of the full range of views based on a forward-looking strategy. Those qualities exemplify what this award is all about. So on behalf of my family, Tom Blyatt and Rifkin Award judges, and the American Foreign Service Association, I am honored to present the 2014 William R. Rifkin Award to Mr. David Lutz.
sandwich on him because he was back in opposition to me. But uh, he was, it turned out that the bar felt he was right and I was wrong. And that's what the deception was for, to make decisions of that kind. But uh, I'm sorry I can't be here. And uh, Tex Harris and I are going to see him in a few weeks at lunch with him and uh, talk about uh, his actual performance. Uh, but, uh, I, but I think the Arkansas Fire is going to see more of that this and more. We've 
have all sometimes been dispirited by the procedures we have to navigate. But few of us have demonstrated Jonathan's determination to resist the temptations of grudging, accommodation, and passive exasperation, and instead try to turn a moment of bureaucratic disappointment into a moment of real possibility. As noted in your program, uh, the issue which prompted Jonathan's frustration was an op -ed that he sought to publish a couple of years ago while serving as the senior U.S. civilian representative in Congo. Drawing on literally a lifetime of experience in South Asia, Jonathan wrote an eloquent essay highlighting the parallels between Malala Yousafzai, a uh, very brave young Pakistani girl nearly murdered for championing female education, and Malala Rewa, the 19th century Afghan heroine after whom she was named. The op-ed never appeared, ground down by a clearance process that eventually produced a dead end. Jonathan's profound respect for our profession compelled him to write the Senate King, arguing for greater risk taking in American public diplomacy. Having served in some of the world's most dangerous and complicated places, and having witnessed firsthand the ultimate sacrifice of his closest colleagues, Jonathan knows as well as I know just how real this risks are. But he also knows that if we are to deliver on the promise of American diplomacy, we must take the initiative and take a few risks in our engagement. And he knows that if we are too careful about not saying the wrong thing, we may never say the right thing. In honoring Jonathan and his constructive dissent, we are reminded of the importance of saying and doing the right thing, especially when it's in community. And in honoring Jonathan and all of his family's very deserving award recipients, we are also reminded of just how fortunate we are to have this opportunity to serve our country alongside friends and colleagues with such resolute integrity and commitment. Jonathan, on behalf of all of your friends and colleagues in this room, and of all the people you've touched across the globe over the past three decades, I'm delighted to present you with the 2014 Christian Herder Award for Constructive Dissent. Thank you. 
anyways uh, for the whole uh, set channel concept. Uh, my own comments actually seem, I think, modest by comparison. But at the same time, I would argue that outreach and engagement uh, is an important part of what we do everywhere. Uh, what I guess they call the spike in the drug in the two Malas in fall 2012 was the precipitating factor uh, for my comments. But I will say, as the as well alluded to, that the use work on by years of seeing, I thought there were too many missed opportunities on the part of our service to engage meaningfully with those around us. In this case, the cable reflected three distinct concerns that actually a number of colleagues around the farm service have echoed to me. One of them is the concern about the length of clearance process. Um, as I mentioned on several occasions, something is seriously amiss when it takes longer to clear a uh, manuscript than it does to write or translate it. This part refers to a book last year that required 32 minutes and again a lot longer to clear than it took to write. Um, second, there is the concern that on occasion meaningful engagement is squashed before it even happens. And again, Bill alluded to it. Uh, actually, a, a foreign service colleague with Ray Putin's in Pakistan uh, made a statement that was very similar to the one that uh, Bill said. And it was far too often we were so afraid of saying the wrong thing that we end up not saying anything at all. Um, and third, there's the concern that we have become too reticent and challenging extreme narratives directly, including radical Muslims. Somehow we need to be more confident about the ideals and foundations on which our own society is built in order to more directly challenge those who are committed to violence and destroying them. Um, it is also my sincere hope that this board will help honor and recognize those who serve in extraordinary difficult circumstances, especially those especially colleagues, uh, some of whom are here today uh, in Southern Afghanistan. Finally, I guess I want to end with a very quick comment that uh, I'm talking to those story. More than two centuries ago, two former political adversaries, both also former presidents, engaged in a long and stark correspondence with each other. Adams, in one of his letters to Jefferson, at one point used a phrase, we have lived in serious times. We too live in serious and even momentous times, and hopefully our entire foreign service can directly confront the challenges that we face in ways that are truly serious and will ultimately make